I'm sure everybody in this room recognizes this headline picked from the press um, over the, the summer months of this year. And I want to ask what you see when you look at this picture. What I see is a beautiful green cyanobacterial outgrowth. Uh, maybe that's because I'm Irish and a microbiologist. Um, and you, water bodies really shouldn't be green unless you're in Chicago on St. Patrick's Day, I would say. But this is uh, also, for me, a highly perturbed ecosystem due to the outgrowth of a cyanobacterial uh, organism, uh, Microcystis aeruginosa, which occurs because of an imbalance in the lake's diet, from that of a, a normal diet to that of one which has a huge uh, increase in phosphorus and other nutrients. And what that leads to is a, a massive outgrowth of this organism and species die off, a catastrophic collapse of diversity in this site. And this is evidenced by you know, fish kills and plant loss in this system. It also, because this organism produces a, a highly toxic uh, a neurotoxin, shut down the water supply of Toledo, a, 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 a town on the lake. And so we've studied these ecosystem collapses for decades. This is something we know a lot about. And the other thing, when we studied this, when I was an undergraduate in microbiology back in the day, the other thing that strikes me about this kind of eutrophication and community ecosystem collapse is that the activities that drive this collapse do not occur necessarily in the lake. They occur at sites hundreds of miles away, at remote from the site of manifestation. And it's largely due to altered agricultural practices, whereupon farmers spread pellets of chemical fertilizer on the surface of uh, their fields. That, coupled with increased rainfall, likely due to climate change, flushes all this chemical fertilizer into the water uh, systems and eventually into the lake where it drives the outgrowth. So there's two take-home messages from this. One, ecosystem collapse is characterized quite frequently by a loss of diversity and outgrowth of a pathogenic organism. And secondly, that activities at sites remote from the site of manifestation drive that phenomenon that we see in the lake. So why am I telling you about this? This is supposed to be about, about the microbiome. Well, it turns out we're just another ecosystem. We are no different from Lake Erie, except our colonization is by microbes. We house trillions of microorganisms, both in and on the human body. We have uh, organisms that reside in every space that we have interrogated across the human body. And each space we've looked at, for example, the Occupal Fossa, uh, will have a specific group of organisms that reside at that site. And that is consistent across healthy individuals. But that is a very different microbial community at that site compared to the one in the oral cavity. But again, across individuals, there's consistency in the types of organisms that reside at this site. So we're in an ecosystem. We are outnumbered hugely by microbes, 10 is to 1 with respect to cells. And when we think about the genomes that these incredible diversity of species encode, we're, it's estimated that several hundred to several thousand organisms reside in the human body, each organism with its own discrete genome. These organisms confer a swath of functionality that we ourselves do not encode, 100 times more functional genes. So to discount this ecosystem and this particular component of this ecosystem, I would suggest is folly. These organisms are critical for our development. That is shown from germ-free mouse studies, whereby uh, animals that do not have any microbial colonization are immunologically and physiologically aberrant. And the only way you can correct that issue is by introducing commensal species to the germ-free mice. So we depend on organisms for appropriate development in very early life. These organisms also produce uh, hormones and vitamins and things that we cannot produce ourselves that are critical, they're essential for our, our survival and for our physiology. And so um, we are critically, uh, by necessity, colonized by these organisms that functionally are necessary for our survival. So how does the microbiome develop? develop? Is it like other s ecosystems for its, its dynamic? It turns out we fit the bill as regards what we know for other ecosystems. It's a highly dynamic process. It begins at birth, where even though we're now starting to see privileged sites like the in utero environment does have a microbial component there, 
it seems like the major microbial exposure occurs during the birthing process of a child. And that's obvious from studies that have shown children who are vaginally born have a very distinct microbial colonization pattern, uh, primarily uh, colonized by Lactobacillus and Snethia species that are found in high abundance in the mother's vaginal tract. Those who are born by C-section have a very distinct colonization pattern, largely Staphylococcus and Streptococcus species that are found in the skin. And so that really mirrors the child's first exposures in life. And what we know ecologically is that founder species, those first organisms in this ecosystem, drive the colonization period over this critical period of the first year of life, when every child's gut microbiome diversifies. And the rate of that diversification, we think, is probably consistent across children, but the types of organisms that get to co-colonize in that system is just dependent on which organisms are there first to define the ecosystem conditions. So somewhere around one year of life, we come to somewhat of a steady state, and that's relative. The organisms in, in the gastrointestinal tract, for example, resemble that of an adult human at this stage. And we go through life with some level of stability, though there are fluctuations in the community depending on environmental conditions. And then in later life, as we reach older age, we essentially start to see the microbiome disassemble. And you won't be surprised, given the germ-free mouse experiments, when I tell you that this occurs in parallel with very dramatic physiological and immunological development. And the same here, but here we see immune senescence as the microbiome begins to disassemble. So again, there's this critical uh, developmental uh, process that occurs in parallel with microbiological development in humans. And what are the factors that influence the microbiome? They are broad and varied, but we actually know many, even though we didn't know it was the microbiome that we were impacting with these factors. Host genetics play a role. Host immune response forms a pressure on the microbial community that, that is present in a given site. Lifestyle, that's very evident from our Western lifestyle, which is very distinct from that in developing nations. And as a result, we see very dramatic differences in, for example, the gut microbiome of children in develop it, developed words, worlds versus those that are developing. Host physiology plays a role as well, and we know that just from healthy systems. We know that the physiology of the mouth is distinct from the physiology of the skin, and as a result, we see a different composition and type of microbiome that resides in each of those sites. And we're beginning to learn that the environment plays a huge role in dictating the colonization pattern in humans. We're starting to see from work in our group that there are differences in microbial exposure in homes of children in the inner city that are related to disease development, allergic disease development later in life. And our hypothesis is that the home environment is now the library of microbes for a child to develop its gut microbiome, and we suspect the microbiome that develops at other mucosal surfaces in this environment. And that the sanitation that we are so uh, eager to, to, to do in our homes is leading to a loss of microbial species that we have evolved with over eons and that are necessary for our, our immunological and physiological development, and that the loss of these organisms are what's driving dysfunction in the microbiome and disease development. And so it won't surprise you, given everything I've, I've told you, that the obese, mi the obese microbiome of the gut is a very perturbed, very dysfunctional microbiome. It is, in essence, Lake Erie. There's a profound loss of diversity uh, in individuals with obese, uh, obesity. And it's not exclusive to obesity, uh, though I will say that Jeff Gordon, who performed the seminal work, showed very beautifully that the microbiome is key to this disease. Because if you transfer the gut microbiome of obese mice to lean animals, the lean animals begin to gain weight at a higher rate than their non-transferred counterparts, showing for the first time that the microbiome can confer the disease phenotype. But it's not exclusive to uh, obesity. We know from several studies in the field in inflammatory bowel disease that we see the exact same phenotype, a catastrophic collapse of diversity in patients who have this chronic inflammatory disease. And it's not just the gut. We've shown that in the sinuses of patients who have chronic sinusitis, the very same framework holds. 
collapse of microbial diversity, and in this case, case we identified a novel cyanopathogen, which uh, Coronibacterium tuberculostericum, which can drive the disease phenotype in um, animals in which we deplete the microbiome and essentially recreate the conditions that we see in our patients. So what's really great about this is there's a framework, an ecological framework for us to understand disease development with respect to the microbial ecology and microbial communities in humans. And to further that, remember I told you about Lake Erie, that it was farming activities that occur at sites remote from the site of manifestation drove that phenomenon. The very same is true in humans. And there are numbers of st studies now starting to emerge that really support this. Wonderful work from Sarkis Masmanian uh, at Caltech has shown in uh, mice with autism spectrum disorder, that model autism spectrum disorder, that manipulation of the gut microbiome with the probiotic bacteroides species leads to abrogation of the, the physiological and phenotypic um, manifestations of disease in those animals. Work by Steve Hazen's group um, examining relationships between the gut microbiome and, the, and uh, cardiovascular disease have shown that individuals who consume large amounts of red meat also consume large concentrations of carnitine. And this selects for organisms in the gut microbiome that transform carnitine to tri trimethylamine. Uh, and that trimethylamine uh, is then oxidized by the host, by us. And elevated concentrations of that one metabolite is, is the single biggest predictor of cardiovascular disease. So we see this now as a, a biotransformation or a fermentation tank that can, con can transform the components that we consume into bioactive molecules that affect various aspects of our physiology. We've shown again in mouse studies that manipulation of the gut microbiome of mice with the lactobacillus species changes the composition of the gut microbiome, alters immune priming both in the gut and also changes uh, allergic responses in the airways of those mice. We can protect our mice against allergen challenge and against respiratory syncytial virus infection in the airways by shifting their gut microbiome composition. And so what we're seeing is a gut brain, a gut cardiovascular, and a gut um, lung axis in the emerging literature. And I would venture that it is a, a gut everything axis. I view the gut microbiome as this massive fermentation tank, or it should be a massive fermentation tank, that bathes the entire system via the circulation with a suite of bioactive molecules that define our physiology and our immunological status. So what do we do with diseased organs? Because if we start thinking about the gastrointestinal tract as a diseased ancillary organ, a new organ that we've identified, what do we do? Well, we frequently transplant diseased organs. So, giving it away, but this brings us to studies where we have attempted this in humans. So patients with Clostridium difficile overgrowth who are recalcitrant to treatment with normal therapeutics such as vancomycin, they are again depleted in gut microbial diversity and have this outgrowth of this uh, Clostridium species. And very recent efforts that have been highly publicized um, and reported in the New England Journal of Medicine have shown that if you transplant a healthy ecosystem or a healthy stool microbiome from an individual to a Clostridium difficile patient, you can restore health to that individual at an efficacy rate of 92% in adults. And this has been recreated in um, uh, pediatric patients as well. Again, a 90% efficacy rate in rehabilitating the, the gut microbiome ecosystem by transferring organisms from a healthy to a diseased um, state. And so, Will this work for other indications? There's a lot of excitement in the field. Let's transfer stool for every indication under the sun. I would urge huge caution. It works for Clostridium difficile because these are a very defined group of patients. Their ecosystem has been highly manipulated, it's very well characterized, and it's, it's colonic. Where we're trying to treat is colonic. In other diseases like Crohn's disease, like ulcerative colitis, 
we're not quite sure what we're trying to treat. Although some of the, the, the studies that we've been doing are starting to show us that we can stratify our patients into discrete groups based on their microbiome composition. Even though they're all considered one disease like ulcerative colitis, we can actually stratify them into discrete groups. And those microbiologically discrete groups of patients, their microbiome is functionally distinct and it is immunologically distinct. And now I think we're starting to see that we may have the capacity to explain and understand different phenotypes that we see in our patients. The capacity to understand why some people uh, respond to therapy and others don't. If we start thinking in terms of that microbiological organ that resides in the human host. So I, I truly believe we are entering a brave new world, one in which for human health, microbiology is going to play an immense role. Um, I believe we have to harness um, these organisms to treat, prevent, and cure disease. And I believe it's very, very possible. But how do we do this? Well, certainly as a microbiologist, I can't do this on my own. None of us can do this on, on our own. We need to consider the ecosystem. We need to break down the silos of those um, uh, areas that we work in, both clinically and from a re research perspective. If you're a pulmonologist studying asthma, you might start considering the gut microbiome as a component in your disease process, a very important component in your disease process. The, true is, the same is true for rheumatoid arthritis or perhaps even uh, atopic dermatitis. We need to think about the whole system. And so to study the whole system, we need a highly integrated research plan that engages all of the disciplines necessary to understand this immense and critical new microbiological organ that we've discovered. I think it's only through doing this that we will truly get to our ultimate aim of personalized medicine. Each individual houses their own microbiological ecosystem. That ecosystem, I believe, is what can drive us towards really the ultimate goal of personalized medicine. Thank you.